Hi everyone, it's Dr. Conlin and welcome to part two of our lecture on chapter 10 from your course textbook, Nutrition Through the Life Cycle. Um, our focus for this chapter is toddler and preschool nutrition. And in this part of the lecture, we will cover objectives 10-2 and 10-6, which involve assessing, measuring, and evaluating children's measurements, particularly height, weight, and what we do about um, the adult equivalent of BMI in children. So child growth and development we talked about a little bit in part one as it being really our key goal in nutrition is to foster and support healthy growth and development. Um, we talked in the beginning of this course, what does healthy mean? And healthy means to everyone something different. Um, we, When we say healthy, we tend to have this picture of um you know, perhaps a person who has all of their physical functioning and they are a certain weight status and don't have any clinical issues, but um, that's certainly not the, um, not going to be the norm or what's expected. In a population, you're going to have a variety of individuals who have a variety of unique needs. So we need to consider what is healthy for the individual as healthcare professionals. So one person's healthy can look completely different from another person's healthy. And I just want you to keep that concept in the back of your mind as we go through the lecture, because I'm going to say normal growth and development, healthy growth and development a lot. Um, so just remember that even though I'm using the words normal and healthy, it's really what's normal and what's healthy for that individual, right? Every individual has their own maximum potential that they can achieve for the best quality of life that they can have. And that's really what we're striving for. Um, so for child growth and development, an infant's birth weight triples in the first 12 months of life. So again, we have this really rapid um, growth velocity in infancy, um, but thereafter growth velocity slows until the adolescent growth spurt. Um, so what does this look like? For infants, again, um, the average weight gain is about triple the birth weight from zero to 12 months. And for toddlers or one to three year olds, the average weight gain is about eight ounces per month. And we also take what's uh, called head circumference measurement um, in early childhood. So um, we can also measure um, their head circumference growth, but just to note that that's beyond the scope of this current presentation. Um, so in addition to weight, we also measure height. And if you go for a pediatric wellness visit, they might take the head circumference measurement. Um, and the average height growth is about 0.4 inches or one centimeters per month. Thereafter, in preschoolers moving into three to five year old range, um, the average weight gain is a little bit less at 4.4 pounds per year. So now we actually look at it in a year. Um, so at periods throughout the year, you, you'll see periods of, of spurting and periods of plateaus. Um, but at the end of the year, what, what does the overall weight gain look like? Um, so the average is about 4.4 pounds. Keep in mind it's an average, so some children will gain less. Some will gain more. The average height is height gain in one year is 2.75 inches or 7 centimeters. Um, so norm, knowing what's normal, what the, the norm or the average is, can then help us... Um, when it comes to assessing uh, individuals that lie farther out on, on the curve, if you think of your standard distribution curves, um, and what does that mean for them? So just, just keep these in mind and be familiar with these numbers. 
So the decreased rate of growth from infancy to toddlerhood is accompanied by reduced appetite and food intake and lowered interest in food in toddlers and preschoolers. You'll often hear parents say, my 12 month eight old used to eat everything, any vegetable, they were such a good eater. And now all of a sudden they won't eat anything. I'm really worried. Is something wrong with my child? Are they a picky eater? Was it my fault? And usually it's none of those. It's totally normal part of growth and development. Um, And parents need to be reassured that this is part of normal growth and development and it's normal for this age group. So if we had this rapid growth velocity in infancy, now it's it's still continuing. They are still growing. It's not that they're not growing. There's still growth, just not as fast. And you can imagine that there's going to be less appetite and food intake, and perhaps even a lower interest in food if they're not as hungry. You'll see during their growth spurts, you'll see that interest in food come back up. And it's very common for parents also to say, wow, my kid will eat everything for three days in a row, and then for two weeks, it's like he eats nothing. And that's exactly a growth spurt followed by a plateau. Um, And that's a typical pattern in toddlers and preschoolers. Yes, picky eating is real. Yes, there are special considerations, and we'll talk about them um, in a later part of this lecture. But a lot of it is also normal. So sort of like breastfeeding, how do you know my baby's getting enough milk? How do you know it is normal eating and that your child is regulating their appetite appropriately to support their own growth. Well, we can measure their growth just like you would measure a baby's weight gain and monitor their weight gain to make sure they're getting enough breast milk. You measure a child's growth. Um, This helps parents and primary care physicians identify normal growth and development versus any potential issues. So if a child, the parent does feel their child is a picky eater, say, um, and you actually see that their growth has plateaued. Um, perhaps they've dropped down in percentile. Coupled with what the parent's saying, that could flag you. That could be a red flag in your mind. You could go, hmm, all right, maybe, you know what, I think just to be sure, let's look into this a little bit more because there could be something going on here. It's very important. But if their growth is is going like it should, um, you know, and they're having these periods of, of food, food loves and food jags where they don't want to eat as much, you know, that that could, you might be able to say, you know what, I think this is just part of normal growth and development going on. Um, and, and so you can give parents strategies for how to ensure nutritional adequacy um, during both growth spurts and growth plateaus. Um, So how do we measure weight in children? For children less than two years old, they should be weighed without clothing or diaper. Why not a diaper? Um, If they urine and if they urinate, then the diaper can actually be really heavy and and contribute unnecessary ounces to their weight. Um, And when they're this young, um, every ounce um, counts and gets measured. So preschool age children should be weighed and measured without shoes and in lightweight clothing though. Um, Usually preschool age children aren't wearing diapers anymore, so that becomes a non-issue. And it can be more difficult and challenging to get up preschool age children in and out of their clothes as well. Um, And always use calibrated scales, and there are different types of scales. Uh, Typically an infant uses a recumbent scale where they're laying down, and then older children can, can stand on an upright scale. Okay. For toddlers less than two years old and those between 24 and 36 months who are unable unable to stand unassisted, um, they then, how do you measure length? Um, Then you use recumbent length where they're also laying down. It's the measurement of the length while the child is lying down using a length board. Um, A length board has a fixed headboard and a movable footboard, and it's better done with two adults, one adult who can um, position the head at the headboard and the other who can make sure that you want their legs to be straight um, to get accurate length um, so they can 
straighten the legs, position the feet, and then they can move the footboard appropriately. And then for preschoolers though, they can usually stand um, on a scale or on a height board. Um, and this is used to measure stature. What is stature? Stature is just standing height. So there's a recumbent length, which is a laying down height. And then there's a standing height, which is also called stature. <clears throat> Um, so taking height and weight measurements are part of what we call anthropometrics. Anthropometrics are really important measurements in nutrition assessment. Um, and there's a wide variety of anthropometrics. And we just saw a couple of different weight and height ones. And here, down here is a picture of what I mentioned earlier with the head circumference. So once you have height and weight, you can plot them on growth charts. Um, the Centers for Disease Control and American Academy of Pediatrics recommend that the WHO growth charts, the World Health Organization growth charts, are used for children 0 to 2 years of age, and the 2000 CDC growth charts are used from 2 to 20. We're going to talk about each one of them. The WHO growth charts for children 0 to 2 years of age were developed as growth standards that demonstrate how healthy children grow under optimal conditions, which includes breastfeeding. So it reflects growth patterns of predominantly breastfed infants, which are the recommendation. Um, whereas the 2000 CDC growth charts um, are based on references using uh, large United States databases, including the National Health Examination Survey 2 and 3 from the 1960s and 70s, as well as NHANES 1, 2, and 3, which range from the 70s to 90s. Um, so they're a reference for how children in the United States are growing in a specific period of time. So it's, it's more time dependent and thus would be culturally dependent too. And as you can imagine, yes, they are a little bit outdated and I'm hoping they get updated soon. Um, whereas the WHO are based on growth standard um, expectations and optimal conditions. Um, so they can, so for those reasons, they are better applied to children zero to two years of age um, and they better capture breastfed infants. Also, though, for the younger age group, um, using CDC growth charts, there was a small sample size for children zero to six months, and weight data was not available for zero to three months, making the WHO a better choice because that data is, is stronger for the WHO growth charts. And you can find a, the WHO growth charts at this URL and the CD growth charts at this URL. Um, and the CDC growth charts, um, I'm going to talk about a little bit more because they are what you'll mostly see in clinical practice here in the United States. Um, have different categories and you can go to the website and select, you can see all of these different growth charts. And depending on what you want to look like, if you wanted to just see where their weight was uh, for their age, you could do that. You could look at their length. You could compare their weight for their length um, and so forth. And there's sex specific. Um, so they're divided into boys and to girls. <clears throat> now, as for BMI, uh, I know we did BMI in adults. Now, what about children? Um, well, we don't use BMI in children. We use BMI percentiles. And um, we actually don't even use BMI percentile for children under two. There are many questions about BMI during infancy that remain at answered. So the use of the BMI chart is not recommended for clinical use before age two years old. The BMI in infancy is based on recumbent length rather than statue. And to date, there has been little research on what BMI calculated from length means in infancy and on the consequences of high or low BMI in infancy. So for that reason, we use um, we plot weight for length on a growth chart instead of calculating BMI and then plotting the BMI and then looking at that percentile for the age group. But for children 2 to 19 years old, we can plot the BMI. So what you do so you calculate BMI just like you would for an adult, then you plot that BMI on a growth chart against their age, 
which gives you their BMI for age percentile. And this shows you how your child's weight compares to that of other children of the same age and sex. Um, how do you interpret this? Let's say you calculate the BMI, you plot it, and you find that a BMI for age percentile of 65. What does that mean? It means the child's weight is greater than that of 65% of other children of the same age and sex. Um, you're going to practice the interpretation in the case study that you're assigned. The goal is a BMI for age percentile in the normal range, um, which is the 5th to 95th, well, 5th to 95th percentile with the 85th to 94.99 percentile um, being at risk of obesity, which we'll talk about on the next slide. But it's just keep in mind the point of this is that it's not like adults where you want to aim for a specific BMI of 23 or 24, um, depending on the person's goals, but instead it's it's a range found within the percentile. Um, and one percentile isn't necessarily, within the healthy range, isn't necessarily better. Um, it's the pattern of growth that's more important to assess than any one single measurement. So let's continue on with talking about BMI for age cutoff. So after you, you've determined the BMI percentile, um, what, is it, what does it mean? How do we interpret it? And more specifically, how do we interpret risk from what we find? So <clears throat> the classifications which provide our cutoffs are as follows. For underweight, it's less than the fifth percentile. A healthy weight is considered fifth to less than the 85th percentile. Overweight is 85th to less than the 95th percentile. Um, you may see, however, that 5th to 95th percentile are sometimes considered healthy as previously mentioned or, or as mentioned as the, on the previous side um, because overweight used to be called at risk of obesity and the terminology was changed. So sometimes it still gets mixed up, but this is the more current recommendations um, to have the four categories and um, healthy weight defined as fifth to the 85th percentile. Um, and so know, know these numbers um, and know these categories. <clears throat> and then obese is greater than or equal to the 95th percentile. Um, and cutoffs are based on risks. So uh, we generate cutoffs from data and do what are called sensitivity analyses to determine uh, how Essentially, how well does a 95th percentile predict an increased risk? Um, and, and, and you can do calculations and use statistical software to see, all right, say, where does, where does my increased risk of cardiometabolic disease really start showing? And um, that answer is the 95th or greater than or equal to the 95th percentile. So if you do categorize data, of a whole population of a variety of children, um, you would like likely see uh, a distribution that ends up showing something along the lines of um, the majority of kids will be healthy, and then you'll have on the right side of curve you're obese, and you could essentially see um, proportionally increasing amount of cardiometabolic risk factors as you go from the healthy weight to the obese category. Um, so another thing is that the CDC growth charts are for children and teens ages two through 19 years old. Um, and, and these are just very frequently used. Um, so when a child is taken to a doctor, uh, they routinely assess these measures. My pediatrician does it at every visit. They plot it on a growth chart. What do they look for? 
let's say, um, you know, my child is 87th percentile. Were they always 87th percentile? Were they, when they were born, what percentile were they? Were they 90th or were they 30th? What's So just because a child is 90th percentile doesn't necessarily mean that there is this increased cardiometabolic or other metabolic risk. Um, it could be the norm for that child, which is why growth charts are such useful tools because we look for trends. If there's a big jump in, in percentile, you might ask what happened there. Maybe they had a growth spurt. Uh, maybe they maybe they had a plateau, right? Maybe they haven't grown for a while, so their weight's actually increased. And then at their next growth spurt, when they increase in height, that BMI percentile will um, kind of go back to whatever is normal for the kid. Um, so it's really important then to correctly measure and plot growth um, because errors can lead to health status assessment errors. So follow standard procedures and use appropriate equipment to weigh. Choose the appropriate growth chart based on how the child was measured, such as use of recumbent length or stature in the child's gender. And it's important it to note that it's the pattern of growth that needs to be assessed. Um, that is more important than any one single measurement. So I'm gonna just take you through a quick practice and let me open my charts. So let's say you are given the following information. You have a four-year-old boy He's 40 inches in height and 41 pounds in weight. All right, what is his BMI? So for that, for children, you use the same BMI calculation, weight in kilograms over height in meters square. Um, there's also a very handy CDC BMI calculator. Although, hold on, does this, it gives BMI and the BMI percentile. All right, so. I prefer you practice calculating BMI using the calculation, um, but you can use the calculator. It's there um, to check as well. So four-year-old boy, let's do four years, zero months. He's a boy. The height is 40 inches and the weight is 41 pounds. So results based on the height and weight his bmi is 18. um now we're given the bmi for age percentile but let's go do it ourselves so what what do we do we have these clinical growth charts there's a lot of them this might look a little overwhelming but just think what do you need let's look go down he's a boy yes is he birthed to 36 months no, he's not. He's four years old. So is he two to 20 years? Yes. Now this is a boy and there's stature for age and weight for age. Okay. The question asks, what is his BMI percentile? So we would want the BMI for age. This is going to give us his percentile. I'm going to open it. Now we know he's four years old and he has a BMI of 18. So here on my x-axis is age, and here on the y-axis is BMI in kilograms per meter square. So I'm gonna go to four years of age and try to find 18. This is easier. Honestly, if you can print, it is easier. And if we were meeting in person, I would totally have these printed for you. Um, you try your best on your computer. If you have access to a printer, you know, and you prefer to print, you could do that. But um, otherwise, try your best on the computer. Um, and you don't need to show me. You don't necessarily need to. Let me see. In the case studies, I'm, I'm not collecting the graph chart. Um, so but I do wanna see your work when you do it. So here we go up to 18 and four years old. Okay, so he's above the 95th percentile. Um, so if you didn't have a BMI calculator, you know, how do you know he's 96? 
Um, you don't necessarily, it's a little hard, so you could just put greater than or equal to the 95th percentile. Mama. Hold on one second. Mommy. Yes, Julia. Okay, can you go by yourself? Okay. Um, she's supposed to be sleeping. So, <laughs> um, yeah, you could just write greater than or equal to the 95th percentile. Um, and that's what you do. And then while we're here, just note that the bottom is, is the 5th percentile. Um, so generally, you want your child that you're evaluating. You know, you want to see them fall between somewhere between the 5th and the 95th percentile. Um, less than the 5th would indicate they're underweight, which needs to be addressed. Greater than or equal to 95th means they're obese, which probably needs to be addressed further. Um, and between the 85th and 94th percentile, that, that varies what, what happens. A lot of times it's kind of a wait and see thing, but there are other red flags, which we'll talk about in another lecture, um, that might warrant further investigation. And there's... Um, guidelines and algorithms also to help practitioners. Um, so it's not just throwing darts in the air, there's rhyme and reason to, to decision making. Um, okay, so the CDC does have good resources. I've provided links for you, please use them, click through them. Um, so what weight status category, he's obese. How would you interpret this? All right, let's go back to where I wrote the interpretation statement. A BMI for age percentile of, we have 96 here, means that the child's weight is greater than that of 96% of other children of the same age and sex. Sorry, you know what? give you my let's fix that please um i think i must have copied it maybe this the initial statement i copied had weight um so yeah that makes sense but the child's bmi the body mass index the ratio of um the weight to the height is greater than that of 60 of well for our case 96 percent of other children of the same age and sex one minute. Mommy, yes, Ryan. Can I forget my face that I made from downstairs? Can I Please give me one minute, okay? Okay. So practice case studies on your own. Um, here's a test yourself, too, for the end of our lecture. For children ages 2 to 19 years old, obesity is defined as what? You can test yourself. Uh, so see Moodle for a case case studies to practice. Um, I'm just gonna mark it. You know, there's really no right or wrong to them. If you have the wrong answer, that's okay. We're gonna go over it tomorrow. Um, so just submit whatever you do. But I wanted to see that you attempted something. Um, and then short root papers were due. And then just looking ahead, you'll have a module three due on the 22nd. Um, which was extended. You have a final short review paper due. Your final short review paper will be due on the 29th. Um, there will also be a module four, which will be due the day of the final exam to the Dropbox on Moodle. And test three uh, will be during finals week, as far as I know. Um, I haven't heard otherwise, which will be online via Moodle, similar to test two. So. If you have questions, <laughs> okay, Julia, hold on. Um, send me an email. All right, thanks, guys. Bye.